All right, good morning. 7.30 a.m. Welcome, everyone. I am Dr. Thomas Rashad Easley, a.k.a. Rashad, and a.k.a. I got a lot of other titles coming to you live from Raleigh, North Carolina. I want to thank the people who are on with us today. And, hey, go ahead and do my usual. Get all of the niceties out of the way. You can follow me on other platforms. Follow me on Facebook.com, Rashad Easley. You can follow me on Instagram. Okay, and Twitter at Rashad Ease, E A S, and then uh, my website, RashadEasley.com, and then my YouTube channel, YouTube.com forward slash R A S H A A D I. Uh, so we upload videos there weekly now, and uh, we're going to go ahead and get into this. And I'm happy to say, I said I'm drinking the nectar. Me and my friend uh, Brian were together yesterday, and uh, we call this the nectar of. The gods, yes, it, this is a mineral water, hot mineral water, a warm mineral water with a ginger in it, and I have lemon in here, turmeric, cayenne pepper, cinnamon, and um, unfiltered apple cider vinegar with the mother in it, yes, so drink helps you well. You remember I told you when I first started this, we can talk about diversity, we can also talk about health, okay, and uh, weight loss and things like this, and this drink kind of makes you a fat burning machine, it helps the body to absorb uh, nutrients and it's great to do this in the morning and it, it is also anti-inflammatory too and it helps to kickstart your metabolism and if you want to um, you know something for the throat you can put some honey in here but it you know and then the other thing is that uh, because it has a lot of minerals it also even helps the immune system is boosting things inside of the body so I feel uh, just exuberant while I'm sitting here talking with you so we're a minute in let's go ahead and let's get started for those of you who have your Bibles turned, we're going to do two different scriptures. Exodus 4, okay, turn to, to Exodus 4, and we're going to read verses 6 through 13, okay? And then I want you to, you know, put your hand there, put a bookmark there or something, and then go ahead and find John 9, okay? And there we're going to, uh, we're going to read John 1 through 11, and then we're also going to read uh, 30 verses 35 through 39, okay? All right, and then for those who are in the area... I'm going to be asked to preaching this morning at a Covenant Presbyterian Church uh, in Durham, located at uh, 2620 East Weaver Street in Durham, North Carolina. So we'd love to see you all out there. If you can make it, uh, come on out and join us, okay? All right, thanks. So I'm going to read, uh, but before uh, reading, uh, I'm going to go into prayer. So uh, join me, please. Um, Heavenly Father, we come before you now thanking you for uh, this time, this time to be online. Thank you for this time to... Uh, to uh, share together, go into your word, and ask that um, that this word uh, touches our heart and our spirits this morning and helps us to uh, not only uh, get closer to you, which is most important, but to have a great day and a great week, and that this will continue to really just permeate throughout the rest of our life. It is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Exodus 4. I said verse 6 through 13, and it reads, And the Lord said, Furthermore unto him, put now thine hand into thy bosom, and he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, put thine hand into thy bosom again, and he put his hand into his bosom again, and plucked it out of his bosom, and behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, and neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river, and pour it upon the dry land. And the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech, and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seen, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Neither therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. But that's Exodus 4. That's us reading. This is uh, Moses talking to God. Uh, Moses having an encounter with God. And God doing really miracles and signs right there in front of him. And really getting him to you know pay attention to the power of God. Because he's getting ready to give Moses instruction to go down and free, free the people, free the Hebrews, free, free, free the Israelites, free the children of, free the children of Israel from Pharaoh. Now let's go to John nine. So that's New Testament. Let's go over to uh, John nine verses one through eleven. And it reads, 
And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither have this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. And he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seen. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? And some said, This is he. And others said, He is like him, but he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes open? And he answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. So there you go. Those are the two scriptures right there that we're going to be uh, even covering today at Covenant uh, Presbyterian. Okay. And also this verse is 35 through 39 in John 9, but I'm going to, uh, I will get to that shortly. So anyway, this is part of the youth explosion uh, that, that, that we're doing today. So you have kids who are graduating, going to elementary school, high school, uh, middle school, college, going to a job, grad school, different things like that. So uh, I'm very honored to be there with them today. And so what I want to do is uh, kind of give you a little bit of what we'll be doing today uh, while I'm there. Uh, and I want to start with um, this story. Uh, uh, so... I graduated uh, a while ago, you know, um, some people say I don't look my age and that's fine. I definitely take that as a compliment. Um, well, this stuff is good. And, um, but I went to Alabama A&M University. That is a historically black university in Huntsville, Alabama. I'm from Birmingham, Alabama originally. And while I was there, I majored in, um, I majored in forestry majored in a discipline called forestry. So I'm at a historically black university, but I'm majoring in something that I don't see a lot of me or a lot of people who look like me there. And I did well at Alabama A&M University, scoring like 3.8 GPAs, 3.9, 3.7. So I you know, had, had my A's. And then I was fortunate to be able to go to the University of Georgia in Athens which is only four hours away, but I was able to go there as an exchange student. And so I went there my junior year, so I would have been 20 years old. And I was only taking 13 credits, and I went there, and I um, and I uh, studied all the time. Didn't miss a class. Matter of fact, in undergrad, I never missed a class, which is actually interesting. Um, and studied and didn't party, didn't, didn't really do anything. And the end of that first semester, I had a 2.3 GPA. And I only took 13 credits. Keep in mind that at Alabama a and I took like, say, 16, 17, 18, and then I'm here only taking 13. And so my my dignity was crushed. You know, my uh, my, my confidence was crushed. And uh, I didn't feel as smart as I, as, uh, as I thought I was. And so I was getting ready to go back to uh, Alabama a and because I was only supposed to be there a semester, but I could have stayed a year. And a good friend of mine, um, his name is... Shalom Rucker, still a friend of mine to this day. He was, he's also an African-American male. And he, um, um, Shalom uh, had graduated that, he graduated that that semester. So he was finishing in economics and accounting. So he knew what it was to be there. But let me give you a little bit more context. Alabama a and historically black university, 4,000 students, you know, mainly black. Then I go to University of Georgia, 31,000 students, historically white university, mostly white. And I'm in their school of forestry and I'm the only black person in the school. And that's really been a lot of my experience. I go play, I've worked places, I'm the only black person in the county. I've worked at departments, I'm the only black person in the department. I'm the only one there. So that's kind of been my, my experience. And so it's the same when I got to UGA. So Shalom was like, look, you need to stay another year. And I was like, why? He said, so that you can show the people what I already know about you. I thought it was being funny. And I was like, oh, really? Oh, so it's, uh, you want me to stay to prove that I can't hack it? He said, no, actually, that is what I'm saying, Thomas. You need to show them what I know. I know that you're brilliant, and I know that you are intelligent. And I said, okay. I said, but I struggled here. I struggled, man. And he said, you struggled because your mind wasn't here. He said, your body was here, but your mind wasn't here. And I said, yes, it was. I went to class every day. 
I, I went to the library every night. I, you know, he was like, Thomas, I, I know that. I know you did nothing but study. I know you didn't play around. You didn't waste time. And I said, yeah. He said, but what I mean when I say your head wasn't in the game, you were too busy focusing on the fact that you were the only black person there. And you were too busy focusing on the fact, or you thought it was a fact, it wasn't true, that you didn't belong there. Or this notion that you weren't smart enough or that this isn't the place for you. He said, so yeah, you went to class every day. But your head wasn't in the game. It's, it's kind of like being an athlete on the court or on the track and you paying attention to the crowd instead of the sport that you are actually here for. You know, so I wonder if LeBron James would have, if he would have focused on the crowd the last at least two games in the series, one in Cleveland and then one back, okay, at Golden State, the last one. I wonder if he would have focused on that. Would they have been successful, which I don't think, you know, hello, welcome. And uh, I don't think, oh, okay, this is Teddy. Hey, what's going on? I don't think that it would have been the same result because his mind wasn't in the game and my mind wasn't in the game. And so this is what, love you too now. And this is what, um, this is what Shalom said. He said, what you need to do, Thomas, is you need to understand something. You chose to come to the University of Georgia. And I said, okay, I know that. He said, so that means that you shouldn't have this arrogant expectation that because you were at Georgia, that it's going to be everybody else's job to open themselves to you. He said, no, look, those people who are up there, yeah, it's mostly, it's primarily or all white people. He was like, but they're not looking at you because they don't want to know you. He said, they don't know you. They went to school together. They went to community college together and transferred in. They went to high school together. He said, that's kind of how it, it goes around here. He said, I'm sure it's the same way with you back home. He was like, so when they see a person that is an outsider, yeah, you're going to look different to them. He said, and yes, you are black. He said, but this is what you ought to do. Switch your mindset. Tell yourself that you do belong here. This is the place for you. And when they're looking at you, they're looking at you because you look good and because they want to get to know you. He said, now open your mouth and lean over and say, hi, my name is. And he was like, and the more you start to do that, you start to see that really, you know, you are being a light here. You are exposing them to something that they haven't, you know, been exposed to. Not that it's my job to, like, educate people, you know, on black people, but it is my job to be myself and live my truth. And that is, I am okay. I am good. I belong here just like you belong here. The other thing that happened was I joined two bands. I did exactly what Shalom said. I stayed. I did exactly what he said. I stayed. I joined two bands while I was there, so I couldn't study as much because we were actually a good band. I played the trombone in one band and I rapped in another one. So I was um, not able to study as much because we had gigs. We were good. Like We probably had a gig like about at the break we were going like every other week. So that was a real fun time for, for me. And I took more classes. I took 16 credits. And this time I took a senior level course and a junior level course. And I even took a graduate level course because I wanted to go into genetics. So, you see, so I, I pushed myself, okay? I really took a step out on faith at the time, and I wasn't even a follower at that time. Guess what GPA I earned that semester? I, I had a 2.3 in the fall semester, right? Ended up getting a 3.75 in the spring semester. 3.75. I had the highest GPA in the school that semester, okay? The highest GPA. I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you the truth. And it was then I started to, it was then that the tables kind of turned on me because the first semester Georgia was like, hey, glad to have you, you know, go ahead and head back, uh, you know, please stay in touch. After the second semester, Georgia wanted me to stay, offering me scholarships, money, everything, you know, and of course, I, don't get me wrong, I actually wanted to stay. I mean, they had, as far as I was concerned, they had better facilities, they had you know, a lot of different things. And I'm like, man, you know, this is my shot. This this environment I can thrive in. This this is great. But I decided to go back to Alabama A&M. Okay. I decided to go back to the place that gave me a shot that didn't say you had to prove yourself. That They said, because you applied, we're going to try to work with you. You know, and that's just how we do in my community anyway. So I'm proud to say that I went back to Alabama A&M and graduated from a historically black university. And I told UGA, uh, you know, if you, if you want me, you know, uh, then grant me uh, access into into graduate school and uh, give me give me an assistantship. You know, so um, so that's how you work that. So what I want to say, I told that story, and I thank you for listening. I told that story because that story was really an example of the deficit mindset versus the abundant mindset. The deficit mindset, I looked at myself and compared myself to other people. Okay, I looked at myself like I didn't belong. I looked at myself like uh, like I wasn't smart enough. I looked at myself like this is not the place for me. I looked at myself like there was something wrong with me. But 
I needed some help. It took someone who had some things in common with me. In my case, it took a person that looked like me or, you know, who was of the same uh, same uh, race and ethnicity uh, as me who had who made it through there, who knew what he was talking about. And he spoke to me. He helped get me through. He kind of helped bridge that chasm. OK, and he got me, helped me to get to the other side, which is having the abundant mindset, which is seeing myself as not based on what I'm about to do on my limitations and not using my circumstances as reason why I can't do something, but just seeing my circumstances as a starting point and acknowledging what I'm here to do. OK, and that I belong here. I am smart enough. I'm good enough. I'm good enough. Hey, I made it here. So I know that I'm, I'm destined for something great. And I'm destined for something great because I'm here. I'm not destined for something great because I'm black. I'm destined for something great because I was born. Because I made it this far, so there's more for me to do. And so, I will, now I want to take us back to the Word. Okay, take us back to the Word now. I want to take us back to the Old Testament. And it's interesting, because the Old Testament, uh, if you look at the word testament, it actually means covenant. So, that's why I love uh, when we read the Bible looking at the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Covenant is a relationship. So, the Old Covenant is one kind of relationship and certain things with, uh, and, and certain parameters, you know, that centered around that kind of a great relationship. And then you have a new covenant, which is a new relationship. And that new covenant is when Jesus comes. In the old covenant, as we read, look at how Moses saw himself. Look at what Moses was doing. Moses is actually getting ready to be told to go down into Egypt to help free his people. And it's really almost like Moses is in training. Like God is showing him, like, look, you don't have anything to worry about. Okay. But look at what Moses said about himself. I mean, Moses, you know, talked about, if you look at it, what was it in verse 10, you know, Moses was talking about his speech, you know, and, you know, and, and Moses knew that he was, uh, you know, Moses knew that he was, you know, up, up in age. And he was like, you know, I'm slow of tongue. And why, you know, why, why me? Why are you calling me? And this is after God has shown him his power, put your hand on my bosom and I'll change it. Put it back in and I'll change it back. See that rod on the ground? See, I'm going to change that into a serpent. I'm going to change not only the rod itself, but I'm going to change it into something else. Put your hand on the tail of the rod and I'm going to change it back to a rod. So Moses had nothing to worry about, but here he is still worried. And see, that's what happens when you lean on your own strength. Okay? When you, when you lean on your own strength, you don't realize you expose yourself to the attack of the devil and also to the lies of the devil. Okay, when you lean on your own strength, you know, the lies that say that you can't make it, that this is not for you. And see, I want you to think about something. Your strength, my strength, is actually grounded. You think about it in tradition. Okay, just like the deficit mindset is mostly steeped in tradition. Uh, and, and anybody, if you think about it, the way that you grew up, the things that, that, that you were taught, um, you know, even the way that we look at how, you know, like say men versus women in the world, and men still think that women are weaker and men are stronger, you know, or even in our country, in the United States and North America, you know, uh, and no disrespect to anyone, but white supremacy is still real, like in the mindsets of people. So it's like you're looking at one group like they're better and another group or looking at yourself like you are inferior. Well, Moses was doing the same thing. And you got to think about who is Satan. Satan is the prince of the air. So that means that even your upbringing, the things that you were taught, a lot of that is actually influenced by Satan. And you don't even realize it. I'm not saying that our grandparents and our ancestors were evil. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that if Satan is the prince of the air, that it, as you're breathing, as you're looking around, if you're not mindful of what you're taking in, you don't realize that you're taking in things that are not for you. Okay? But when we read John 9, you also, I want you to notice something. John 9, the disciples had the same mindset of a Moses. Okay, the disciples had the same mindset. And here's how you know. Because think about it. They were looking at this man who was blind, who, who could not see. They were looking at him as though because something challenging is happening to him, God is not in his life. Because the question that they asked was, what sin did he or his parents do for him to be in this state? Now, that's a real scary way of thinking because that means what you're saying is because people are going through difficulty or challenges that God is not with them. It's just like how we say when people die or because you're alive, be thankful because you're alive. Like, yes, you know, you get to see another day. Now, I do believe that getting to see another day is a blessing. I totally agree with that. But what I also don't think that death is a curse. Like, we don't see the blessing in death because my word teaches me that to be absent of the body is to be present with the Lord. So that means that we should not just be happy to be alive. There are a lot of other things for us to be happy about, like the fact that I can talk to you, the fact that you are on Periscope, the fact that you can hear me, the fact that some of you can see me, the fact that you can hear me. Think about all the things that you'd be thankful for just off of that. Okay. So 
When challenges are in your life, that's not a sign that God is not with you, but it is a sign that God is about to get the glory if you keep yourself in God's hands. And even let's look at the status of, let's say, like certain groups in this country, in the in the in the U.S. of A. As we talk about education, uh, we you know, like they use this terminology, say that there's an achievement gap. And in particular, I'm going to a church that's primarily African American, uh, so I'm going to be talking to the kids about that. They talk about this term achievement gap, and I want you to understand that using that terminology is very supremacist, because what you're really saying is that. There's one group that's achieving very well. So I'm going to put my hand here as this one group. Then you have this group over here that's not achieving very well. And what you're really saying is this group that's not achieving very well should be achieving like this group. So like this group over here is the model group and this group is not. And see, here again, that's deficit thinking because you're comparing one group to another without keeping in mind the factors that contribute to why people are achieving or not achieving. OK, the abundant mindset understands this, that some people are achieving or some groups are achieving more than other groups because they have access to things that these other groups don't have. Access to great networks, access to great schools, access to money, access to great education, access to the best teachers, access to great learning environments, access to probably good food and good water. Like all of these other things, OK, that people have access to that impact their learning. And that's why I started with the story around UGA giving you those factors of like where my mind was when I was in one environment compared to when I went to another environment. So look at what the disciples said. What did this man's parents do or what did he do for him to be blind? But look at what Jesus said. Jesus actually said neither. Neither one happened. But God is basically going to get the glory of what's about to happen with this man. Now I want you to look at what the blind man did. The blind man, he was obedient. In his obedience, he expected something. He was a humble witness. So the blind man knew what happened, but he didn't completely understand why it happened. Okay? He knew when and where it happened. He didn't understand how it happened. See? But the same way that he didn't get that, it's the same way for us out here. We can't explain everything. We're not called to be experts, but we are called to be a witness. So as I'm talking to those young people today, as well as the older people or the middle-aged people, is that they need to understand we're called to be a witness. You're not called to be an expert. Okay? So I'm not in school to prove to you that I'm worthy of your respect or to prove to you that I'm intelligent. I'm meant for greatness, not because I'm black, as I said before, but I'm meant for greatness just because I was born. So I made it into this world. So, this, so there are things that I have to do. That means that if you're here and you're alive, there is a purpose for you. There is something for you to do. But it's not to prove yourself to someone else. You see, you see, when you walk in confidence of who you are, I don't have to prove myself to someone else. It's not my it's not my job to force you to believe my truth. It's just my job to live my truth and be as great as God meant me to be. So now, let's talk about abundance, because now we're getting ready to wrap this up. Let's talk about the abundant mindset. Jesus said that I came that you might have a life and that you might have life more abundantly for those who know it. Some people think that abundance means that I have no problems or no issues. That's a fantasy life. It's not real. And some people think that abundance means I have resources of all measures all the time. Now, I'm not against prosperity or being rich and wealthy. But what I'm saying is that when you have too many resources, I want you to understand something that actually ties you to this world. Because you think you own things, but what you think you own actually ends up owning you. Because you notice that the more things you have and the more things that you accumulate, the more you want to protect what you accumulate. So here's Jesus who is really the best example of what it means to have an abundant mindset and to live an abundant life. Abundance means full dependence on God because you know where your blessings come from. And you don't have the same worries and concerns as, as everyone else. And you understand that it's your job to be obedient. It's not your job to understand everything. But it's good to get the help that you need and use the resources that are there. But you don't compare yourself to other people and don't compare them to you because they are not you. Okay? So if we want to know what Jesus did and how we're to live. That's what you got to do. Pay attention to what Jesus did. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John has right there tells you what Jesus did. You don't have to ask the question, what would Jesus do? And I remember back in the 90s, that, that became a real big slogan. And, and I'm not trying to down that slogan, but I'm just trying to say, you, you don't have to ask that question, what did Jesus do? We can actually just look and say what Jesus actually did. So I want to challenge you just like I'm going to challenge the people at Covenant Presbyterian to let Jesus be your example of an abundant mindset. And what does it look like? Well, let me read some, uh, I have a notes here in front of me. Let me read some, some ways uh, or some like, what does the abundant mindset, you know, kind of look like? Number one, you're not limited to your circumstances. 
The only thing circumstance does is give you a starting point. That's all it does. It gives you a starting point. Number two, you pay attention to your business and your relationship with God. You don't try to determine someone else's relationship with God and their business. Number three, everyone has access to God's goodness, which means you're not entitled to anything. Okay, And whether you believe that or not, you can look at people who don't believe and you can look at people who do believe. Just like you see good things happen sometimes to bad or people that we consider bad and bad things happen to people that who are good or that or that we consider good. So God's God's uh, just reigns. God's reign reigns on the just and the unjust. God's love. My success is in my hands. Number four. But I realize that I still need other people. Okay, the abundant mindset understands that I have to take responsibility for me, but no one makes it on their own. I still need other people. Even Jesus had disciples. Okay, the Savior of the world. Even Jesus had disciples. I understand this. God is everything. Okay, God made everything. So because God made everything, God is in control. So God is everything. For me, a lot of the, a, a lot of times I get this question: How can I be a secular rapper? Or be like a professor and then be a pastor at the same time. And that's because I don't separate secular from religion because there is no separation. We try to do that. We try to do it like that, but there is no separation. Just like there's no separation between church and state. Like a lot of people's religion governs how they vote. A lot of people's faith governs how they vote. There's no difference between secular and real. The only difference is what the lyrics actually say. Same music, same instruments, different purpose, but it's all still music. So I don't separate that because I understand God gave me every talent and gift that I have. So I use every talent and gift that I have to honor God. It's not my job to judge you, but to accept you and to be myself. OK, and that's really big because I know a lot of us know you, you've heard that, that, that this, this, this phrase, hate the sin, but love the sinner, hate the sin, but love the sinner. Right now, here's the thing. Sin is a part of who we are. OK, those who believe, you know, Christianity, sin is a part of who we are. So we're born into sin. And because of Jesus, our sins are clean. OK, but when you say hate the sin, love the sinner, I don't know what people understand is you're actually saying hate a part of me. And unconditional love is accepting and loving all of me. Even the parts that are not good or the parts that are ugly or the parts that maybe you don't like. So for you to say hate the sin and love the sinner, you're saying to hate a piece of me. If you can hate any part of me, you can dehumanize me. If I hate a part of you, I can dehumanize you. you know? And that's not what Jesus said to do. So that's not a term that I live by. That's not something that I preach and that's not something that I even promote. Okay, no, love me, unconditionally love me, recognize that I'm good enough and see when I understand that I'm good enough that I'm going to see you like I see me. Now, I'm not I don't mean I'm going to hold my expectations of Thomas on you, but I mean, I'm going to see you like I see me. If I'm hungry, I know how to go and give me some food. So if I see you hungry and I have something to give you, I'm going to give it to you. You know, I don't let anyone take advantage of me. So I'm not going to intentionally, you know, and I hope unintentionally take advantage of you. So that's what I mean when I say see you like I see me. Then, when I understand that I'm good enough, that means that I'm walking in healing. Because you got to keep in mind, hurt people hurt people. Okay? Jesus never hurt anybody. Because Jesus wasn't a broken vessel. Jesus wasn't a hurt vessel. Jesus was a sinless vessel. Didn't mean he didn't do anything wrong. Because if you read the Bible, you see that he did do some things wrong according to traditional or, or based on traditional perspectives. But he was sinless. He understood. He had the relationship, the ultimate relationship with God the Father. And so... Because of that, he didn't hurt people. Uh, Jesus always focused on needs and not wants. So I tell, so the abundant mindset, that's the other thing. You focus on needs and not wants. That means that you focus on the vision in your life or for your life as well. I don't tell young people or anybody to follow your dreams, okay? I'm not saying I'm opposed to follow your dreams, but I don't tell people to follow the dreams because dreams are externally stimulated. Visions are internally stimulated. OK, a dream comes when I see images, like if I see 50 Cent on television or I see LeBron James or I see Simone doing everything in the Olympics or I see an Angela Bassett on television or I see a T.D. Jakes or Joel Osteen or Joyce Meyer. Like when I see them like, oh, it's like I want to have what they have. Right. You know, President Obama, I want to be in the White House. I want to I want to do that. I want to do what I see them doing. But when we think about the vision, the vision comes from within. So. A dream is something that I see. A vision is something that I'm shown. Okay, and the vision, like for me, is not that I'm going to do what they do and be like them. The vision for me is specific to who I am and what I'm called to do. And so 
that also means that as I learn that about myself, I got to know what I'm willing to give. Because here's the thing. The thing that you want is the thing that you give. The abundant mindset understands that. So if you want love, you give love. If you want respect, you give respect. So as we bring this to a close, um, as I was saying to you, the abundant mindset, to me, um, Jesus is the best example. And I think the only way you can have it is to have a relationship with Jesus, to look at what Jesus did and to understand what Jesus did. To have the abundant mindset means I'm not depend. my feelings are not dependent on what other people think of me and say to me that it comes from within. The abundant mindset is what God has told me who I am and how God has told me what I am and how I am to be. So for the young people out there, when you go to a place, remember, it's not your job to prove your intelligence or your worth. It's your job to be the light of God wherever God has put you and allow your greatness to shine through. To the older people, it's the same for you. And and that is church, at least from what I understand, there are a lot more elders than there are young people. And sometimes, especially in our community, young people were told to be seen and not heard. But what I want to say to our elders is that I respect you, but you don't have respect because you're an elder. You have respect because you give it. See, the abundant mindset, you give what you want. So respect is a two-way street. I understand that you've lived a long time, and so you have institutional knowledge and lived experience to educate me through wisdom on what it is that I am supposed to do. But the younger people are the ones who are living and coming up in this time, so they know things. I mean, the fact that I'm talking to you on this device right here, the things that we are not accustomed to using, that some of our older people are not accustomed to using or afraid to use. See, we can bridge that divide between young and older by everybody being humble and understanding that I'm not called to be an expert. I'm just called to be a witness. And I'm here to help you. It's not my job to judge you and to fully understand your circumstances, but it is my job to give you love and to show you love. Okay? Because I love myself. And I am good enough and I am great because of the way that I was made. So, I give you that word. Thank God for you all listening. I hope that that word actually touched you. Abundant mindset versus the deficit mindset. Which one are you operating in? And I want to close with this, that depending on certain aspects of factors going on in your life, determine that. So I don't think that everybody can just say I'm operating in abundance in every in every area, or maybe I'm thinking kind of deficit in every area. No, you're probably thinking abundantly in some areas, but maybe in deficit in others. Like you may be thinking abundantly when it comes to going to church, but maybe not when it comes to health. Or thinking abundantly when it comes to being in relationships, or wanting to be in a relationship, but may, but maybe not when it comes to self-care. You know, maybe you're being abundant when it comes to hanging out with friends and, and your hobbies, but not really doing a, a, you know, a great job of taking care of your own household and, you know, taking care of yourself and really expanding yourself. So we have to continue to work. And I really believe for me that more happens when with God being at the head of my life and God being in my life. So I invite you to do that, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. And remember, we'll see you next Sunday, same time, 730 a.m. Hope you all enjoy your Sunday and your week. God bless.